Dear all, I bring you greetings from Ghana. I want to thank the organizers for choosing and selecting this all important topic, preventing and responding to abuse. It has, of course, mental health implications. So I applaud the organizers for this initiative. I will be discussing the topic types, predisposing factors, and reporting processes of abuse. First of all, abuse is defined as treating a person with cruelty or violence, especially regularly or repeatedly. You know, when we pray our Father, there is a clause, they said, deliver us from evil. Abuse is evil. And for us in the body of Christ, we pray that these violence and abuse will not befall us or any member in our community. Abuse has become a global menace and understanding the problem will help us to respond appropriately and collectively, we can reduce the impact to a large extent. So, first of all, I would want to go through the types of abuse. I will look at the predisposing factors and continue with the reporting procedures. I will touch briefly on some of the challenges in handling abuse, especially in Ghana. I will summarize and then conclude. For the purpose of this presentation, I want us to zoom into what we call intimate partner violence or domestic violence. That will help us appreciate the content and the scope in detail. When we talk about domestic abuse, it is defined as a pattern of coercive tactics, which include physical, psychological, sexual, economic, and emotional, perpetrated by a person against another within an existing or previous domestic relationship, with the intention of establishing and maintaining power and control over this victim. We will use the term interchangeably, victim and survivors. So, globally, it is uh, estimated that one in three women have experienced one abuse or any form of abuse in their lifetime. And surprisingly, all countries are making efforts and they have been over 1,000 585 legislative measures across the 195 countries from Europe, America, Sub-Saharan Africa. Everybody is making effort to reduce this menace. Unfortunately, we still have staggering effects and numbers soaring by the day. In Ghana, for example, it is estimated that three out of five women suffer domestic violence, and one out of three women have experienced one form of assault one time in their life. In Ghana, the statistics is so overwhelming, and I tried to put the data from 2016 to 2023. And from 2016, we recorded a total of 12,000 176. The numbers kept increasing, but it's interesting to note that within the COVID era, which is 2019, the records hit up high rocketing rate of 18,219, and it dropped in 2020 to 16,586. And as of 2023, the number was still at 15,813. I believe 
um, participants from across uh, the sub-Saharan Africa have their own interesting statistics. At the panel discussion, this will come up for discussion. And I'll be very happy to know what is happening in the other areas. Now let's come to the types of abuse. The first one that I want us to look at is physical abuse. First, it, it affects the physical well-being of any human being. This includes punching, throwing of objects, slapping another, forcible confinement or detention, depriving another person, access to adequate food, water, shelter, rest, or subjecting another to torture or other cruel and inhumane treatment or punishment. So for example, when you go and bring a child to stay with you as a domestic help, and you make that child work from morning to evening, you don't give them food, you don't give them rest, it is physical abuse. I'll continue to look at emotional, verbal or psychological abuse. And it is defined by the Domestic Violence Act 2007 as any conduct that makes another person feel constantly unhappy, miserable, humiliated, ridiculed, afraid, jittery, or depressed, or to feel inadequate or worthless. This include insults, wrongful accusation, humiliation, screaming at people, threatening, intimidation, mockery, silent treatment, bringing other women into your matrimonial home. All these constitute emotional abuse. So for example, you, have, you are staying with your husband and you have issues, and then there is silent treatment. Whenever you want to buy something, then you write it. Hey, please, I want the children's school fees. You leave it on the table. Nobody is talking to anybody. You don't eat my food when I cook. You don't, give, you don't just mind me. It even extends to lack, denial of sex. When you do that, you are emotionally abusing your partner. Now, we know that abuse doesn't only affect the elderly. Children also go through abuse emotionally. Sometimes we think that they are not old, so they don't feel anything. Children are also impacted by abuse. So for example, your child is a stubborn child and you always insult them. Oh, whoa, oh, yeah, yeah, that. you will not prosper. All these th words that we utter to our children have long lasting impact negatively on them. So please parents, try as much as possible to take uh, precaution and not be meting out very harsh words to children. It can damage their mental well-being. I now go to economic abuse. Economic abuse is the deprivation or threatened deprivation of economic or financial resources which a person is entitled to by law. So for example, you are married. Your wife, you have got uh, assets together. You deny her everything. And what even makes it worse is that in such abusive relationship, the person withhold money. If you want to go and buy a sanitary pad, you have to come and ask. Anything that you want to buy, you bring a list. And sometimes the men will carry it to the uh, shopping area, buy it and bring it to the women to use to cook. These things are emotional abuse. Spending, controlling spending. Hey, you, you are, you are wasting the family money. You are doing this. Every time it's money, money, money. Money is meant to be spent anyway. So if you are in a relationship, your wife has to look good. Your husband has to look good. So if your husband or your wife is spending to make the family comfortable, then please, it's, it's important that you don't control everything. And remember that the essence is to control the person who is the victim. Now, the other element of emotion, economic abuse is preventing employment. There are people whose partners don't want them to work, especially women. 
I recently is handling a case. I'm handling a case now, two teachers. And the man always collects the lady's salary. And he will put 200 Ghana cities, 300 maximum. And so the woman is working for her. I call this modern day slavery. When you have these things happening in your relationship, how can a woman who has a five-year-old daughter works with her own energy, takes vehicle to school, come back, and then at the end of the month, somebody collects her money and gives her like one hundredth of what she has worked for. These are all economic abuse. Financial exploitations are all forms. Now let's take a look at sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is forcing to have sex with another person. And it's also about sexual contact by a person knowing very well that they are infected with HIV or STI. Some people would deliberately extend or distribute illnesses because for them, in their mind, somebody gave it to them, so they also have to distribute. These are all forms of abuse. But in the category of sexual abuse, we have what we call defilement, which is the natural or unnatural canon knowledge of any child under 16 years of age, with or without their consent. And this is referenced from the Criminal Offenses Act. So if a child is very huge, big, and she's 15 years, and then she tells you that, look, oh, I like you. I want to be your girlfriend. And you go on and have sexual or intimate relationship with her. This is against the law of Ghana. It is termed defilement. And when this happens, and there is evidence of abuse, you will be held accountable, it will be liable. And there is a, a fine, which is imprisonment, seven to 25 years, maximum of 25, minimum of seven years, if you are found guilty of defilement. Rape, a lot of people think that, oh, as long as, I mean, she has agreed to have intimate relationship with me, I am covered. If you even get to the point, the woman has agreed and she gets to a point and she says, no, please respect her. Don't force her. And I have had a couple of people asking me severally that, what about if she's my wife? And you know, women, we always make excuse that we are tired, we are tired. So if she's my wife, can't I go on and then have my way? You have to respect her. Because for us, we are mostly emotional. And because of the way our moods go, if it happens, you just have to take your time. Go and work, do your homework very well. And then come back in a more poised manner. And then you know what to do as adults. If you force a woman 16 years and above to have sex with her with, without her consent, the fine or the penalty in Ghana is the minimum of five years imprisonment and a maximum of 25 years imprisonment. There is an element of sexual intimacy with siblings or family members. It's called incest. And it's, it's interesting to note that these things are coming up in recent times. I've had a case where a father defiles his own daughter, impregnates her, and for him, he thinks that, oh, I'm teaching her how to uh, know sex when she grows up. Okay. The law is saying that if the relationship is a son, daughter, father, mother, including half brother, half sister, grandfather, grandmother, grandson, and granddaughter. It must be noted that any person who permits any of these relations to have carnal knowledge of the girl is guilty of incest. That is what the law is saying in the Criminal Offenses Act. So if you have your, your siblings or cousins 
and they are having intimate relationship, please, it is bad. It is called incest, and it's against the law. It's having sexual intercourse with someone you know. You really know that you have blood relation with that person, but yet, because they are close to you and you have access to them, you try to take advantage of them and abuse them. It is abuse against human rights. All these abuses are against the individual's human rights. And we all have to work to ensure that these things are brought to the barest minimum. There are other forms such as sodomy. That one is against boys. We have had cases where we went for an outreach and there were a group of boys and they, they thought that so oh, it's normal. They would just give them yam phones and they were sexually abusing them and they didn't want to tell their teachers. At a point they had to be wearing three boxer shorts because their inner started uh, dropping. So we had to take them to the hospital and we brought them to their homes and informed their parents. Surprisingly, when we asked them to help us arrest them, nobody was willing. So these things can go a very long way to psychologically scar our young people. Because for them, they are young. They don't know the implication of the future on, the, on their, even their sexual life. So there, are, there is indecent assault and carnal knowledge of any idiot. I mean, you know, sometimes there are people who have mental issues around. You see them pregnant and you ask, who, who really impregnated them? And there are people who take advantage of them, take them to obscure places and then have sex with them. And these are when you are found guilty in the laws of Ghana, you will be jailed between 5 to 25 years. Child marriage is also another offense or compulsion of marriage. You know that the child is less than 18 years, and then you say that you want to marry them. And you don't even allow them to grow to mature. And I worked in Sudan and Somalia, and I saw how these young people go through a lot of pain from pregnancy till they deliver. At a point, some of them had to, their, they, their rooms were ratchet and they had what we call fistula. And it was that bad that these girls have to go through the pain, oozing, and when they stand with you, you cannot sit because of that pungent smell that comes. So having young children married off to older men can create a lot of psychological pain with its own medical uh, problems. Now, compulsion of marriage also is another face of violence. So for example, oh, you see somebody, you don't like them, and they, they want to force you to marry them because of the benefits that the family may get out of it. So it's also against an adult, though you think that, oh, she doesn't have a choice. She does. She does have a choice. In Ghana, the legal framework is so varied. The UN Convention is there, the domestic violence, human trafficking. And I know uh, a lot of other participants also have their uh, various types and various categories. At this point, I just want to throw a word of caution. I have some photos which I would uh, share with you on some of the types of abuse and its consequences. So there's a picture that is up here, a husband using hammer to hit the face of his own wife to the extent that she has been broken down. I mean, her face needs reconstruction. Boyfriend also uses cutlass to just cut off the wife's hands and as you can see, this woman is in blood struggling for her life. Sometimes when we talk about abuse, uh, we, we, we think our men are not part. They are also suffering. I did my, my PhD dissertation and then my research area was on male victims of intimate partner violence. And 
One of the interesting things that happened was that when they come to report, they are shy. So they said they want to see commander. They don't want anybody to listen to them because of the stigma. And I tell you that a lot of males are suffering in their homes because their wives are intimidating them, abusing them. Some of them, they even beat them physically. And they have bruises all over their faces. I remember in one of my interviews, uh, a man, he said, Madam, one of the things I'll tell young men is that they should never do ordinance. Because the moment I did ordinance and took my wife to the altar, she changed. So I'll, I'll tell young men not to do an ordinance marriage. But you see, it's about the individual. Uh, so whenever you have these uh, males, please give them the opportunity to also pour out because they are also suffering, just like the way we are. We've seen people pour acid on their partners with very damaging. This boy is uh, less than 12 years, and he was sent with money to buy something. And you know children and the way they play, he forgot to bring the change. And then the caregiver used nail with a hammer and just hit the head. And told him that, look, I'm going to give you this so that next time when I send you, this person was jailed and she is still serving a jail sentence. There are cases of very dangerous defilement cases. This girl, for example, the person did it continuously, eight year old, both front and back. And this girl, unfortunately, we lost her because of the damage that had gone on. Babies are not even spared. I have two classical cases where I got really affected by what I saw. This boy also died. This nine-month-old baby died. But some time ago, I was called to the police hospital. A baby, the mother was very devastated. What happened? This woman just breastfed her baby. And a pastor who had visited their neighbor, and he told the pastor, look, my baby is in the room. I just want to run off to the market, buy something. So whenever you hear the baby crying, please pick her up because I will not be long. Immediately the mother left. This man picked the baby from the room and put his penis in the baby's mouth. You know how babies suckle? The baby suckled everything and the man discharged in the baby's mouth. When the mother came, she saw the white signs, but she thought the baby had vomited because she just breastfed him. Two weeks down the line, the baby started having complications, having temperature and all that. At the end of the day, the baby was rushed to the hospital and then the baby passed. It was the postmortem that discovered a patch of semen in the baby's stomach. So, when we have these people in our midst, we have to pray, deliver us from evil all the time so that this will not happen to us or our children. From bands, as for the defilement, it's, it's too much, especially for our young girls. Now let's take a look at some predisposing factors. Somebody will say, oh, if you are in a relationship, and somebody is abusing you, can't you just leave? It is not that simple. The abuser and the victim sometimes can have their own predisposing factors. So some of, one key issue is the mental health condition of the people that are affected. So sometimes we have people who are psychotic or they have schizophrenia. I once handled a case of a mother of four. And for her, when the, she gets into her uh, psychotic stage, all her children will be put in a room and locked. No light in the house, no air conditioning, nothing. Because for her, when they put on the lights, then the spirits are coming to devour her. The children were suffering because those children need to do their homework. And some of the episodes coincided with uh, their normal work uh, school time. 
they will not be allowed to go to school. When the father wants to intervene, then there is a big problem. So these things can really be beyond uh, individual comprehension. Sometimes it's because of the mental health status. Personality issues can also come to play. You know, sometimes people are very narcissistic and they always want to inflict pain. They, they, are, they just don't care about anybody. And people are sadists. Somebody will say, oh, what is sadism? Sadism is when the person just enjoys, you know, there are times that they say, oh, ah, uh, if you don't beat me, then it means you don't love me because when you beat me, then you pamper me. So these are all examples. The, the other one is cultural vulnerabilities and FGM, uh, widowhood rights are all embedded in the uh, issues of violence. Unemployment and low levels of income can really push somebody to become vulnerable to abuse. Low education, they say education helps. But when you are educated, you know, you, can, you have your rights, you are empowered. But if you are not educated, sometimes you don't even know what constitutes abuse. Okay. There are also some spiritual dimensions to abuse. For example, some uh, spiritual leaders will tell you that, look, if you don't allow me to take you through this exorcism, then it means that uh, you, you are not going to be free. So you see pastors and religious leaders abusing women because at that stage they have become very vulnerable. For most of us, remember that there are red flags. If you are entering a relationship and the person controls you, including your telephone, your gadgets, please know that you are not in safe hands. Now, when we talk about reporting procedures, there are rules that govern the process. For most people, report immediately to the police, irrespective of where you are, as soon as you experience any form of violence. In cases of rape and defilement or sexual offenses, please don't wash before you go to the police. We strongly advise that don't wash or take your bath because most times people will be rushing to clean themselves. When you do that, you erode the evidence. So the process or the steps in, uh, in investigation is the receiving of complaints followed by criminal investigations, prosecution. And there are times that we do a lot of referral and medical support, especially when it comes to post-exposure prophylaxis. I think we will share the slides with you so that you can have the details as to how the processes are done. One of the challenges that we have had in Ghana is the difficulty penetrating to the walls of the family because every family wants to remain intact. So they, they are shy that when we go to the police, the matter will come out and then everybody will know that these things are happening. And sometimes interference from opinion leaders can really also affect the process. For the effect, I know somebody will talk about the effect, but what can we do as a church? First of all, we need to create temporal safe havens for our survivors because they need it. And then we need to create a counseling unit. I know that there are a lot of social support services within the church. We want you to amplify it, enhance it. And also let's talk about it because sometimes when you don't know, you will always be held up in bondage. Also let's support and encourage our survivors so that they can go for early treatment and we should not trivialize abuse at all. And lastly on this point, please, we should not support out of court settlement and say that we are taking drinks to pacify the person, no compensation. Abuse is abuse. And let us all try to ensure that we protect our children and our community members. So I end with a quote from Desmond Tutu of Blessed Memory, who is a human rights activist. He states, and I quote, if 
You are neutral. In situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. End of quote. This is, for me, a very significant statement. And it's telling all of us that there is an oppressor. And whatever the oppressor does needs some sort of punishment. So don't take the side of the oppressor and allow the victim to suffer. They have not done anything wrong. So, finally, everyone has the responsibility to be aware of domestic violence or abuse. The first step is for us to change the narrative. And I want to thank the church. I want to thank the organizers for making this year a very interesting year for us to talk about abuse. It's interesting for us to educate ourselves and know what even constitutes abuse. We wish ourselves a very pleasant conference and we know that you will be our advocates for change. Thank you all and may God bless our conference.